Hey, what's up? Liron here. Thank you for joining me in another painting tutorial. Today we're gonna paint these sunflowers and I think this is a good opportunity. We haven't had a still life in a while it feels like and it's a good opportunity for you to see me going with a painting process that isn't as straightforward for me. Okay, I struggled with it quite a bit when it came to where should I glaze, how dark it should be. I'm trying not to go too dark, but then it feels like it needs to get darker. So hopefully you'll see all of this. I hope you like the end result as well. So with that being said, let's jump into the process. Okay, so we'll get started with the drawing stage. Now this process, when I cut it down just to how long it took, uh, it was about an hour and 20 minutes. So I had to shorten it a bit because First off, it's too long. And second, there are a lot of redundant things of me glazing again and again and again, because I'm not sure. So I think this is a good opportunity for you to see me struggle a bit, trying to find my way and slowly working it around making this look like something. I'm actually very proud of the end result. It's just that it was hard to get there. Uh, and it's not exactly what I planned, but that's fine. So I'm starting with the vase and the, and the um, uh, sunflowers. Now notice how I'm not putting in the details for anything. I'm kind of blocking in the large shapes. And this is a concept I always try and teach my students and I also always try to emphasize here. Uh, you always want to start from large to small. Start with the large shapes then slowly work your way to the smaller details within them because first you have to see if the overall composition works, if overall where you place everything works. It's the same thing for now that I'm starting to work on my comic and it's so weird, it's such a bizarre experience. Um, you start first with the large shapes, where I'm gonna put the character, where I'm gonna put the elements of the background. Then you start fleshing out the details. And what you see now is I'm starting to do just that with the sunflowers. I'm working based on the general and it's like gestures if you ever tried gesture drawing meaning drawing people but focusing on the movement it's the same thing the basis sets up the gesture it's a rounded shape and then the pedals come in and complete the details but the thing is if you start with the details you lose the gesture you won't be able to just mentally imagine where to put every pedal some people can do that but i think it's a very rare um, rare talent and uh, people like Kim Jung Gi have that and you're I don't know if you're familiar with him he sketches huge scenes in compos in a perspective with people just from his head he remembers everything and I don't want to take away from uh, the hard work he put to get there because he really said he always observed things and he's been drawing ever since like he was really really young so I don't want to take away from his this I just say that very few people get to that level um, and I think for most of us, it's better to start with a gesture, with an outline, with an overall. Gestures aren't outlines, by the way. Maybe I'll talk about it in the future. But it's better to start with the large, work our way towards the small. The large enables us to know where to put the small stuff. Now, I'm a bit sneezed. I'm a bit, <laughs> my nose is runny today. Sorry about that. I may have to take a break. And also, there's a delivery that's supposed to come. So in a few moments, you'll probably hear bzz, and then I'll have to just cut the video for a moment. Uh, but you won't notice. It's going to be instantly, obviously. So we got the sunflower we got the small, I don't know what it is, guards or uh, small things that look like mini pumpkins. Then we have the corn, um, corn uh, stalks, you call them, corn cobs, corn cobs in the, in the little basket. Uh, and then we have one kind of fallen sunflower on a cloth uh, that's close to us. There is this, um, you know, oil lamp. Uh, on the right side that I will ignore probably. I put it in just in case I'll try to get it in, but it's just so complex and it's such a nuance within the shadows. Honestly, I prefer to give up on that. Maybe I'll try that in the future when I'm not filming. It's just super hard and I made it a little easier for myself because this is already a complex thing. I think it would be, this subject would be easier to paint with acrylics or with oils, I think. Um, just because there's a lot of darkness and a lot of variety in the darkness that um, with watercolor, again, it's a one-way street. So it's fairly hard to, you know, lighten things up and fix stuff like that. You can only go darker. So it's a bit of a gamble. Uh, but in any case, now I'm starting to work on the petals. And I decided to take an approach that's uh, from light to dark and not covering the whole thing up. So I did a video in the past. You remember that uh, I show how I... Uh, cover the whole thing up and then I show how I paint the different sections first. So here I'm going with the second approach, the painting the small sections first. My uh, my um, logic behind this is that if, and by the way, now I'm doing wet and wet. My logic is if I'm going to start with the um, lightest areas, then I can 
know what my lightest light is and then I can put in the, the darks accordingly. Some people would just negative paint around the whole thing first, set up the darks, you know, everyone has their own way and that's perfectly fine. So now I'm kind of moving between the more vibrant yellow and the more muted dark yellow. Uh, these are going to be the highlights. Right now they don't appear to be highlights at all because you don't have the context, you don't have the dark background. These are all things that once you start filling in the different areas of the painting are going to fall into context. Which is why I always say don't judge your paintings early. It, they may end up suck sucking or really being really bad but don't judge them too early because you don't know that you won't know that until you put in the darks you put in the mid values you put in everything okay so right now it looks like nothing and i'm starting to put in the uh now wet and wet to get some of the shadows in between the petals of the sunflowers just to get some kind of a feeling of um of depth and, and material like to so that they feel like petals they have different curves and light and shadow and all of that uh, the next step for me would actually be to start um establishing some uh darks because i want to i have the lightest light and then i want to see what my darkest dark looks like okay but first i have to go through all of the light sections of the painting that's just a decision i made for this particular piece uh, it's not how i would always approach this i'd probably approach this differently if it was a smaller painting it's still relatively small, but or maybe medium size. Um, I think this is 11 on 15 inches, or maybe no, sorry, my bad. It's hmm, uh, 11 to 7 on no, I think it is. It is, I think, 11 on 15 inches. Um, and so I would probably do this a little differently um, had this been a smaller piece, because you can focus on different things a little better, uh, probably would have to get rid of a lot of the details. So now what you see me do is I start with the light and then I work my way to the darker. So I started yellow, then put in the green. On the left I started with just pure water and then I wrapped them up in yellow and orange. And that's a good way to, to get a blended edge. If you don't want to first put in the dark and blend it, you can just put in the light and put the dark wet in wet. See what I'm saying? So if you look at the, the orange thing on the left, it's kind of a guard or what, I don't know. I don't I have no idea what it is, a mini pumpkin. You can put in the, um, the outline of the orange and then blend the center into white. Or you can put in just water in the center and then put the orange around it. It'll just blend a little easier, in my opinion. Um, so now here I'm moving into some mid values. This green is a little darker than the yellows. Um, and I wanted to put that in because it's, a, it's kind of an isolated element. I had a, a picture in mind of what I wanted it to be like. So sometimes I'll break my own kind of workflow if I get a, uh, you know, a, a, some kind of a inspiration boost for a certain section of the painting. I'll work that. In. I'll, I'll make sure to get as many details as I can there and only then I'll move on to the next area. So this is a somewhat isolated place, you know, it's just this one single uh, sunflower. So I wanted to get that in. Now I'm putting in the greens, okay. Um, the greens are already darker than the yellow, <clears throat> so I may have to darken them later on. But for now I'm just putting them uh, as a bit of a darker maybe than the yellow. It's not significantly dark, it's still quite light. Um, I'm trying to vary some of the green, meaning I put in, you see a bit of yellow in it and then a bit more blue, but this painting is from the get, is kind of um, doomed to be muted palette, a muted uh, color palette, um, because I'm doing a lot of mixing and I try to stay a little more loyal to the source. Had I wanted to make it more vibrant and more saturated, I'd probably go for separating the greens and the yellows completely. So I would put in uh, the blues and the yellows. I'd put in yellow and then blue for the actual green areas. And then maybe later on I'll add that, you know. It's just a way of, you know, you, when you split the colors, you get um, a bit more of a colorful result. But as you know, I'm working on not going too saturated, not going too dark. So it was a good exercise in that. Now notice the left section has some pretty strong greens and vibrant greens. On the right, I started fairly muted. Um, I think it was a good way of balancing it out, but then I realized I do want them to be a little more green, so I'm doing some wet and wet for the shadows. Starting to fill in now the actual, um, I don't know what you'd call it, the core of the flower, um, uh, where all the seeds are. And, um, and just working my way around, finding all of the highlights. Now there are some corn, like individual corns there, so I put them in. And now I'm starting to calculate uh, my next step. So before I actually start working on the darker values, I'm going to put in a background. Now here's 
was my rationale, my idea for this. I wanted to start with a warm background so that later on I can glaze it with a cool blue and darken it and then have a neutral, somewhat neutral result. It didn't end up working the way I wanted it to, as you'll see later on, but it was an okay step. It wasn't the end of the world. Uh, I would probably cover the vase with a, with a blue, unless I do it here, I just don't remember. Uh, let's see in a moment. And the thing is, I start very wet with the background. I don't go dark as you usually are used to seeing me. The reason is this is a bit larger. It's not this, this tiniest, the smallest paintings I usually show you. And if I start now working with a very dark color, it's going to be hard to preserve the wetness. For me personally, it's hard. It's possible. It's something I need to work on. Getting an even wash with a darker color, darker value, it's, it's a challenge for me. So I decided not to go for that. Okay. So... I'm kind of cutting myself some slack because I know some things are challenging for me personally. But ideally, you would want to work on, and I'm working on, the skill of doing an even dark wash. Some artists, like if you look at Alvaro Castanet, he starts working from the darkest areas and then works his way out to the lighter ones. And that can also help. Had I flipped the painting, which I didn't want to do here, started with the darks and then the, that are closest to the bottom of the vase, the where the wall meets the table, that would have made it perhaps easier. Uh, but I didn't want to do that. Now, because it's time-lapse, it's a bit confusing. The first layer has dried, and now I'm starting to put in some darker shadows. Now, here's where it gets extremely tricky. What you want to do is bring out the shape of the petals that you set up earlier by putting in those shadows. That's the whole idea. It's negative painting, a lot of negative painting in watercolor, which is why, by the way, this, this process is so grueling and, 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 and repetitive that I didn't want to do this real time. Besides the fact that it tires my voice to talk for an hour, um, it just is a lot of repetitive action. And I think this process actually works better in time-lapse form. So I hope you still enjoy this. Now, you see how I'm establishing the shapes of the patterns of the paddles with the dark. Now, this is really hard and I don't, wa don't want to say I did a perfect job at it. I messed it up quite a bit, but you can still start reading the shapes as paddles. Okay, you want to think about this a bit differently. You want to look at the shape you want to leave there and try to visualize painting around it. It's it's a, an exercise in and of itself. I actually talk about it in many videos and also in my courses. It's something you have to work on individually. Uh, it's just such a challenging skill. Now, as for the color I'm using, I'm focusing mostly on warm darks right now, okay? Because it's the petals, it's the... Uh, the, the area around the petals, the flowers, they're a bit warm. I'll contrast it with a dark background. Okay, now uh, a bit about the, the materials I'm using. Paper, Saunders Waterford, 300 grams cold press, my favorite paper. I'm going to run out of it soon and then I d can't get it anymore because they stopped bringing it here to uh, Israel. So I'll have to uh, switch to Arsh, whatever. Um, the palette is my usual Mugello 18 Wells. I'm using a mix of Daniel Smith and M. Graham paints here. Um, I love the M-grams, they're super soft. I think the Ultramarine is an, an M-gram and the Thalo Blue is a um, Daniel Smith. Uh, red is also M-gram, yellow is, um, I don't remember, I think M-gram as well. Um, you see, I'm tr trying to establish the shapes of the leaves here. It's not perfect, but it starts to get the point across. And remember that once we put in the dark background, it will make all of the sunflowers pop, okay? Now the brushes I'm using, and I talked about them a lot lately, is the Escoda brushes. They were really awesome and sent me four of their plein air sets. So these brushes are foldable. You can separate the two parts and then close them. And they come with a really cool um, a small, uh, what do you call it? Like a sm small bag. Not bag, uh, what do you call that thing? Like It's like a holster for brushes, it's so funny, um, which I love. So they sent me four of these sets. Each set has three brushes. This is the red set currently, and I'm playing around with them so that I can do a proper review soon. I will say this, the tip is amazing, and I talked about this in the other videos as well, and I'm gonna start putting in the vase. The tip of the brush is so darn accurate, I can get almost all of this painting done with just one brush. It's really easy to do it this way. Now they also have a couple of sword brushes that 
kind of like a rigor brush, but with the thicker bases that are so good. They have a, an incredible water capacity, just amazing, really. Then there are the Perla brushes with the uh, white bristles. These I love. The only ones I didn't love are the ones that are flat and rounded edged um, because the water capacity was too low for me. But the other ones were incredible. So overall, I think these are really uh, a really good product, especially for planner. I plan on doing a proper review, but these are amazing. This is the red set. I'll link it down below. I always link them in the materials I'm using. Um, the only exception is, I, I don't remember if earlier I used the larger one. I have a larger Escoda, uh, Ultimo Synthetico, which is a 16 size. Maybe I used that for the background. I don't remember. So it's not a part of the set. Uh, but in any case, really good brushes. The black set is by far my favorite. So if you do want to get a planner set um, and, and you're kind of painting similar subjects to me in a similar style, the black set is a, a surefire one because it has a large brush that's really good. It has a smaller brush that's the, even better for small details. And it has this sword that just has incredible water capacity. It's just so good. Um, so yeah, I, I knew they're good for a while now, but now I finally started playing around with them more. Uh, so here's the basket. The basket was a nightmare. Um, I wanted to get it step by step very slowly. You saw me also blending in the vase. Sorry, I didn't talk about that part a lot. But um, the basket is, you have to ask yourself, how do I express this highly complex object? Um, here's the larger Skoda brush I have. How do I express this very complex um, uh, subject with fewer details? Because if if you... If you want to show all of the details painted more photorealistically, you have to slow down and work in smaller sections. And then this video will probably be at least three times longer. And I didn't want to do that. I may do something like that in the future, by the way. Um, I'm not against it completely. It's just not my usual stuff. Um, so yeah, so you, you saw I leave a bit of highlights where I see them, like a crisscross pattern, like the straight pattern down under the, the top section of the basket. I try doing my best. Now onto the background, I'm working my way into another layer, still quite wet because I still want to have some movement in it. So I'm still not brave enough to put in the really uh, dark value. I'm going to blow my nose, sorry. It's really runny today. Um, and yeah, just going from top to bottom, slowly, carefully, with another <laughs> wet glaze, which means I'm going to have to do another one afterwards. But notice how already the sunflowers start to come out a bit. Their shape is a little clearer. Um, the, the basket on the left is going to be a little clearer with the corn cobs. It's just going to make things a little easier to read and figure out what's what, you know. In the last, last video I did, I did a flutist statue. And there my emphasis was really on keeping it light. I'm still trying to do that here. I know I'm going to mess it up a little here because it's so much nuances in the dark. So, you know, it's you do your best. Uh, I will improve that skill. There I think I really was able to keep things light. But here, the background kind of forces me to go a little darker because it is dark. You can, this isn't enough, what I'm doing right now. You know, it's not dark enough. And um, with the flutist, I could kind of get away with... Um, splitting it into uh, a very, very light um, to light value and the white. So the white was the highlight. But in any case, you know, it's all up for interpretation, really. You saw me mess up and going over the, this cloth. I just dabbed it out with a piece of toilet paper that's common, that happens. Notice how I'm establishing the edge of the cloth, okay? Sometimes uh, people are curious about how to bring out patterns or material or cloth or whatever. And I always say the secret is in the values. If you can get the, the values right, you'll get the end result you want, but also in the edges. So edges and values. This is how I personally convey materials. The edges let you know that it's a cloth. Um, while the value, it's quite light, it sets it up as a white cloth. You know, same goes for dog's fur or for every texture or pattern you want to convey. The edges play an important role with it. Okay, now I'm starting to put in the details for the corn cobs um, because I plan on putting on another dark value. But you see, you always try and get, get one element of the painting with the right value, then you go for the other one. So I did a background, got it a little darker, then I returned to some of the details on the vegetables. Um, after I finish with the vegetables and I feel like I got to where I wanted to be, I'm going to put in another darker background. You see, you always move in between the elements trying to get the, um, the right impression. 
if I really have a strong vibe with the process and I feel really good about it, I won't need to do that. Uh, I'll be able to just put in the value I want and be done with it. But that's um, that's a very challenging thing to do with the more complex uh, scenes like this one. So I'm not even trying really. Um, I'm not really uh, going for a direct thing here. So here is a very <laughs> tricky part. Now I'm starting to put in a dark background, okay? This is almost as dark as it'll get. I will darken it again later on, which is why I said it's gonna be a grueling process, but this is close to the final value of the background. Um, you can still see in it, and here's where, oh, by the way, I added a line to show where the wooden plank ends, because that area is a little darker, and it will allow me to have a pause, a break. Now you're gonna see this on the right section as well. As soon as I get to this line, I switch to a darker value, and this is a break for me, because a dark value allows you to take a break for a while, because no one will see if the wash isn't uneven there. So now I'm moving on to the left section, and I'm gonna finish that before I move on to the right section. So it just allows me a bit more control here. Now this is where I really have to paint negatively around the basket, because I'm starting to work with a value that's actually darker than the basket, because earlier I could kind of glaze over it. Now it's done, no more vacation, now you have to work really hard. Um, and while I'm at it, I'll probably blend some of the background into the vase, because the, va the sunflower vase, the tin vase, I don't know if you can call it a vase, but it has dark edges on the right and left, so it'll be a good opportunity to get these without um, getting too many shapes in and keeping it pretty simple. Well, let's see if I do that, I don't even remember. Uh, but now you see I also, the, this glaze is blue. It, so my hope was that when I'm gonna put the blue over the red from earlier, it's gonna read properly, make sense, um, and neutralize the value. The result is still quite blue, so not exactly what I was aiming for. Here I'm gonna leave a small highlight for the oil lamp, um, the old beautiful oil lamp, and cut through some of the leaves, make the shape a little better. The oil lamp I'm not gonna use, it's <laughs> gotta be super hard and I decided to again drop it out. Now here's where you have to be careful. Notice this single sunflower that's a little closer to us. You wanna get that kind of a thing accurately. So here we go, around, very gently, very gently. Um, and yep, just cutting around it, cutting around the, the cloth now, have to be careful, make sure that I don't mess it up. Now I do wanna blend that small highlight I left for the lamp, so I'm gonna try and put in some water there and see what happens, and then, then it kind of, if it gets lost, it gets lost, but it's still there and I dabbed some of the paint, so I'm fine with that. Um, next step, I would actually have wanted to add some of the um, shadows, shadows to the sides of the vase, but I didn't do it, obviously. Um, so we're going with the basket, starting to add some of the uh, darker shadows. I think this is almost the final dark value. And we're about, I think, uh, two thirds of the process done. Um, this is where you can really see what's going on. And you have to sometimes take a break and analyze what you have and just think what would make this look closer to the, the end result I want. This is where we're, we're kind of done with the large washes, aside from the background that I will add a bit of later on, you'll see. But we're done with the major large washes, so we have more time to think, okay, should this be darker, should this be lighter? Just take your time, ask yourself these questions, I always do that uh, with the more confusing references and subjects. Here I flipped it, okay, so let me give you the rundown of this. I wanted the background where the elements are, where the basket starts, where the fruit are to get darker because it's too light. So instead of starting at the top and going at it again, I decided to darken the background and then use my spray gun to blend the edge. It didn't really work out the way I wanted to because then the top part felt light and then I had to add darkness to that. So I kind of went at it in a really crooked, lame way. But that's fine, you see I'm just using the spray gun to spread out the paint and get a blurry edge. It does bring out the corn cobs and the basket and the vase a little better and all these mini, mini guards, but gourds, what do you pronounce it, who knows. Um, but it's not exactly the effect I went for and once I flip it, you'll see. I'll flip back the painting and you'll see what I mean. But in any case, you know, doing our best, starting section by section. If you put in a wash and you hate the way it looks or you don't like it or it's not what you planned, don't worry, it happens to me too, it happens to people. Um, with different varying levels of experience. Now looking at it, it's not as bad as I remember it, 
but I did feel like, okay, I have to put in some dark background near the sunflower. So here we're at, we're at it again. And you see now it starts to dry, so I have to be really careful. So I'm using the spray gun a lot. I'm gonna blow my nose. Sorry about that. Once again, <laughs> it's a bit of a rough day. Um, so yeah, you see I'm putting in this background wash and it's not as even as I'd wanted it to. I was, I was hurrying, I was impatient. It's one of those things you have to work on. I should have taken a break and then returned to the painting. Sometimes when I film, I'm, I'm under time pressure to get everything done before I lose the natural sunlight. And then I have to move on to other tasks. I admit it's not the perfect conditions for creation. Um, so sorry if that hurts the, you know, the the quality of the art or the, the process itself. I'm still not in a position to hire a bunch of people to do the production for me and then I can focus only on painting, maybe in the future. Um, I hope to get there. So when I get there, it's gonna be a little easier. For now, I'm doing my best. Uh, so I hope my best is enough. Um, so now I'm starting to build in the shape of the vase. I've kind of darkened everything but it. So it's time to really get those details in. The sides are fairly dark. Uh, the middle has this highlight, but it's not too strong. So I'm kind of blending the edges of these, you know, darker sections on the right and left, trying to get a uh, gradual transition, um, using some wet and wet if I can to bring out this, this strong shadow under the sunflower, but this is gonna be built in phases. It's not gonna be done in one go. Now, after I'm done with this, the table itself should be darker, but I have to work carefully around all these corn, single corns, um, and all of the other shapes of the different things on the table. So that's a bit of a, an annoying <laughs> wash to do because I don't like to really skip uh, or paint around things uh, as much when it compromises the quality of my wash. Sometimes I feel it does, um, but sometimes you have no choice. You'll just have to make the wash wet enough, make it, you know, just work. <laughs> so that's, that's that. Uh, watercolor can be tricky that way. You just have to do your best. And especially if you're doing plein air outside, you don't really have a choice. You will struggle and you will have some parts that are really tough and annoying. So it's just a, something to to deal with, you know? So now after I darken the background and the, the table and everything, it's time to put in some shadows for the, the different elements on the table. I am trying to get these to be the final shadows so I won't have to go darker. Maybe I'll do some wet and wet, but I don't wanna glaze over these because I already glazed over so much of this scene that I want these to work on the first go. Um, so getting this left section in, trying to use somewhat neutral shadows, um, very gray, very muted. Um, maybe I'll be able to finish the whole narration before the, the delivery gets here, which will be nice because sometimes that cuts the train of thought. They're always late, so I guess it, there's a good chance. There's like five more minutes to the process. So here we go. Notice how beautiful the yellow now looks because of the shadow. I love that moment when you add the shadows and then the highlights turn into a, an actual full-fledged highlight. Um, and again, whenever you do these, you don't only have to think about the value, you also have to be accurate with the shape. So when you know, I talk a lot about the values, it's easy to take the shapes for granted, but you actually have to render the shapes of the shadows in a realistic and convincing manner. It's not as easy. Uh, right now, for example, I'm trying to get the, the highlight on the stalk of the sunflower, the flipped sunflower to look good. That takes thought. You have to carefully observe the reference, see if you can do some wet and wets to make it look better, see that the edges make sense. There's a lot of things involved in getting it to look good. Um, the values and the color you have control over because you're mixing it on the palette, you're still not on paper and you can test it out before you apply it to your painting, just use a test paper. But once you're on paper, you have to get the shapes right while it's wet, while it looks good. Um, and that's really a part of the challenge with watercolor. You can't just rework things forever and uh, just let them dry and then come back with uh, highlights where necessary or vibrant colors where necessary. Watercolor are transparent. It's gonna go, you know, the, the more layers you glaze, it's gonna go a little muted. The more you glaze, it's gonna go darker. There's not a lot to do in it. It's a one-way street in both the saturation and the vibrancy and everything. So you have to really have these things in mind. That's one thing I'm trying to work on, on a more higher level, figure out how I can get some parts to look really saturated and really strong and even opaque almost 
and other parts really dim and muted in a balanced way. So instead of being able to get one part very light with tricks and gimmicks, how do I create a nice impression when it comes to the level of the entire painting and the composition? Because right now that's something I still work on. Now notice something cool, the corn cob, the right corn cob in the basket really blended with the background. I love when these things happen. Even some of the sides of the, the basket and some of the sunflowers feel like they blended in with the background, which is a really neat effect, I think. It just looks so good um, when there's a variety of edges. And it was a mistake here. I wasn't even planning on getting that variety. But in any case, now all there's left is pretty much just some touches on the, uh, the green parts of the sunflowers, add a bit of mid values to them. Um, and, and maybe some final darks, really, but not too much. The, the colors, again, in the, when we look at the whole painting, are fairly muted. I went for a muted palette. I mixed a lot. That's what happens when you mix a lot. If you want to get it vibrant and more, uh, more saturated, you have to do some things in the first go, like the sunflower petals. I wouldn't have done that way if I wanted to keep them saturated. I just put the yellow in. All sorts of things that you have to learn with time. I'm still learning with time, you know. But in any case, this is now done. I signed it, and now let's remove the uh, tape. Sorry about that wire on the right that's charging my camera. But here is the final result, sharp edges, the way you like to see it. I really hope you enjoyed this uh, process, and now we can wrap it up. So this is it for this one. As you've seen, I had to go back and do the same things over and over again, redo a wash, uh, darkening it uh, gradually, which is perfectly fine. Some people just work that way. For me personally, I don't enjoy it as much. Uh, so I do like to get the right value and temperature and color and everything in one go if possible, but that's fine still. Now, I think it's an important lesson as well in just <laughs> pushing through and not giving up uh, because uh, I just, many parts of this process. I was like, I don't like where this is going. Uh, and still, I'm not 100% perfect with it. But I think a lot of it is just a matter of style. I mean, I usually like a bit more vibrancy in some spots. Um, and this is fairly muted. So that could also be it. But in any case, I hope you enjoyed the process. And I hope you learned something new from it. Uh, as always, the link to the reference photo will be in the description box below. So if you want to give this one a try and show me and tag me on Instagram, um, that's so definitely feel free to do that. And also the link to frustration free watercolor course, if you want to learn how to paint free loose watercolor freer and looser than this one for sure. Uh, be sure to check it out. And I will see you again in the next vid real soon.